Good morning, friends. We'd like to welcome you to the public meeting of uh, West Darlington this morning. Um, we have a visiting speaker from the West Lafayette congregation. His name is Brother Mike Madden. And the theme of his talk is, do you recognize Jehovah's sovereignty in your personal life? Brother Madden, you have our attention. The majority of mankind today follow a course of self-determination. Uh, they think that personal freedom or deciding what is right and wrong in their own eyes is the most important thing. But what has this resulted in? Well, we see rebellion, strife, and moral breakdown in society, don't we? Now, many experts uh, give various reasons for why this is happening today. But really, there's only one reason. The reason for this turmoil we see today is because people have rejected Jehovah's sovereignty. What do we mean by that word, though, sovereignty? We hear it often, but it really has a simple definition. It is supremacy in rule or power. For example, a king might be sovereign because he has the ultimate authority over those that he rules over. So that's all sovereignty is. It's that ability to rule or having the authority and the power, we should say, to rule over others. Well, who is the ultimate sovereign? Who is the supreme sovereign? It's Jehovah God, isn't it? We recognize that, and rightly so, because uh, there's good reasons to have him as our ruler. Let's look at some reasons. First of all, he's the creator. He made everything. Everything is dependent upon him. And that's what the Bible itself says here in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. We invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to go to the fourth chapter of Revelation. And in verse 11, we'll see why Jehovah is rightfully the universal sovereign. It says, you are worthy, Jehovah, our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power because you created all things and because of your will, they came into existence and were created. So just because he's the creator, he has the right to be the sovereign. He was not created. He did not inherit his sovereignty from anyone else. He has always been and always will be. And for that reason too, he is the universal sovereign. We must recognize that sovereignty in our lives. And therefore, that's why we've asked that question in the theme of our talk. Do you recognize Jehovah's sovereignty in your personal life? Well, Jehovah did not have his sovereignty challenged for billions of years when he created the angels in heaven. They never challenged his sovereignty. But then when he put man on the earth, his sovereignty was suddenly challenged. It was a spirit creature, someone whom Jehovah himself had created who saw an opportunity to attack Jehovah's sovereignty and to establish a rival rulership or sovereignty over mankind. Just think of it. If he could convince humans that he had a better way of ruling, then he could control them and wrest their loyalty away from Jehovah. But put yourself in the Garden of Eden. Was Jehovah withholding anything good from that first human couple, Adam and Eve? No, he was lovingly taking care of every need that they had. He was lovingly exercising his rulership. In fact, didn't, uh, doesn't the Bible say that Jehovah created man in his image? So he gave man some of the same qualities that he possessed. 
Now that doesn't sound like a selfish sovereign, does it? So here was man living in a paradise and he was given an assignment. Again, not a, a routine, mundane, day in and day out uh, assignment to do something that's repetitive and boring, and, but rather a very loving assignment to populate the earth with their offspring, to spread the paradise earthwide, and to live in harmony with the rest of his creation. So Jehovah had man's interest at heart, didn't he? Man would have been happy doing it. And Adam and Eve today would have, would still be living if they had not rejected Jehovah's sovereignty. Well, let's see how they did that. Now, first of all, Jehovah imposed a small test on them to see if they would support his right to rule. Let's read about that in Genesis chapter 2. And we'll go to verses 16 and 17. Jehovah as a sovereign had the right to impose this one small restriction upon man. Look there in Genesis 2, and we'll read verses 16 and 17 together. Jehovah God also gave this command to the man, from every tree of the garden you may eat to satisfaction, but as for the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it, for in the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. So Jehovah imposed only one restriction upon man. It didn't uh, cause him to suffer at all. It wasn't something uh, that was a hardship on Adam and Eve. It was a reasonable test to see if they would support his sovereignty. But along comes this spirit creature who has suddenly gotten this idea in his mind that he would like uh, to establish a, a rival sovereignty. He wanted the worship of Adam and Eve and their offspring. So he employed this tactic of using a serpent who could somehow miraculously talk and reason with this woman Eve. And he tried to convince her that God didn't really have their best interest at heart. Let's go back to the book of Genesis and, and we'll read that uh, brief conversation together to see how Jehovah's sovereignty was challenged. If you're there with me in uh, Genesis chapter three, we'll read the first five verses. Now the serpent was the most cautious of all the wild animals of the field that Jehovah God had made. So it said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from every tree of the garden? At this, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God has said about the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, you must not eat from it. No, you must not touch it. Otherwise you will die. At this, the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die, for God knows that in the very day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. So there was the challenge. First of all, Satan did not challenge directly Jehovah's sovereignty. No, he knew that Jehovah was the universal sovereign because of his creatorship. In fact, Satan himself had come into existence because of Jehovah. But really the challenge concerned the rightfulness and righteousness of God's way of ruling. What Satan was saying is, Jehovah doesn't have your best interest at heart. No, he's doing these things selfishly. He's withholding something from you so that he can exercise that power in a domineering way. Did you get how Satan phrased that uh, uh, challenge? Did you see where it says, God knows that if you eat of that fruit, you will 
begin to know good and bad for yourselves. It was really an assault on Jehovah's truthfulness, his goodness. Just think the creator was withholding something that they needed and he wouldn't give it to them according to Satan. So here is Satan trying to wrest control of this couple from serving Jehovah so that they would serve him. Satan was saying the couple would become enlightened. They would become like God if they would just eat of that fruit from that one tree. Now, was it just Adam and Eve and their loyalty to Jehovah that Satan questioned? Really, every one of us uh, is involved in this idea of whose sovereignty, whose rulership are we going to support? Let's go back to the book of Job. Long after Adam and Eve had died, the man Job came on the scene and he was viewed as a very righteous man by Jehovah. One day there was an assembly of Jehovah's servants, the angels in heaven, and Satan comes in among them. And he makes this accusation. If you go to Job chapter two, we'll consider verses three through five as we listen in on this heavenly conversation. And Jehovah said to Satan, have you taken note of my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. He is an upright man of integrity, fearing God and shunning what is bad. He is still holding firmly to his integrity, even though you try to incite me against him to destroy him for no reason. But Satan answered Jehovah, skin for skin. Now pay attention to this. He says, a man will give everything that he has for his life. But for a change, stretch out your hand and strike his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your very face. So there's the accusation. He wasn't just saying Job would prove unfaithful if he threatened his life, but every man, no man serves you, Jehovah, because they love you. They only serve you because of what they can get from you. So every one of us is drawn into this challenge as to whose sovereignty, whose rulership are we going to support? But it's been thousands of years, even since Job lived. Why hasn't Jehovah, Jehovah acted? Why hasn't he done something to firmly establish his sovereignty in the minds of men? Well, it wasn't because Jehovah was ambivalent, was unsure of whether he should be the rightful sovereign or not. And certainly it wasn't because he didn't have the power. And that's an important point, isn't it? Satan didn't challenge Jehovah's power because if he had, Satan wouldn't be here today. That would have been an easy decision for Jehovah to make. He would have put Satan out of existence. But Satan was probably counting on Jehovah's fairness, uh, saying to himself, now, if I can prove that man will not serve Jehovah out of love, then maybe Jehovah will let me live. He can't destroy me because I've proved him wrong. So really, it becomes a moral issue as well, doesn't it? Who is right and who is wrong? Was Satan going to prove that he was right and that man could make his own decisions and benefit himself? Or was Jehovah right? Did man have to listen to his creator in order to find real happiness? That's another reason why Jehovah has allowed time to go by because he's allowing mankind, people like you and I, to prove that we serve Jehovah out of love. We have been given the opportunity to prove Satan a liar. Just think of that. We have lived into the 21st century so that individuals can still make that choice as to who is going to be their sovereign. Are they going to make their own decisions? Or are they going to allow Jehovah to give them direction? 
What a wonderful opportunity we have in Proverbs 27, 11. We're told that we can make Jehovah's heart glad if we choose his sovereignty. And another reason Jehovah hasn't acted until now is because he's giving Satan an opportunity to try every sort of government, philosophy, moral standards in order to try to prove that his side of the issue of sovereignty is correct. And it would take time uh, to prove that, for man to try all of these different uh, uh, systems uh, that we've seen in place. They've all failed up until now, and the ones we're seeing now are failing, aren't they? So it takes time for Satan to use every scheme in order to divert man's love and loyalty from Jehovah. It's about to come to an end, though, isn't it? Because Satan has run out of tricks uh, in that sense. Man cannot really devise anything else in opposition to Jehovah to try to prove that he can be happier without God's rulership. So Jehovah's patience is about to run out. Satan has tried every ploy imaginable in order to divert man's attention away from serving Jehovah. Satan's challenge even reached into the heavens. The spirit creatures, the angels in heaven, including God's own son, uh, their loyalty was called into question as well. So Jehovah sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, uh, to the earth in order to provide a way out of the situation that we're in today. And when, Satan, when uh, Jesus came to the earth, he proved in a perfect way that Satan is a liar. Man can serve Jehovah out of love. In fact, Jesus was so confident that he had proved Satan a liar that the night before his death, he could say to his apostles, I have conquered the world. So there is reason why Jehovah has allowed time to pass before bringing an end to Satan's malicious rulership over the earth. But how can we individually show that we want to have Jehovah as sovereign? How can we show that we recognize his sovereignty in our lives? Well, the first thing we can do is by reading and studying God's word, the Bible. It's just like any government that uh, we live under. We try to learn what its requirements are, its laws are, so that we can be obedient to them and thus benefit ourselves. And that's true with Jehovah's rulership. We want to learn as much about that rulership as we can. We want to learn what he requires of us uh, so that we can please him. So a diligent, regular study of the Bible is essential. We also want to avoid being presumptuous or prideful, arrogant. Isn't that the way Satan is? And that's the way he has manipulated people to think that their ways are right. No one can tell me what to do. We want to avoid that type of thinking. We want to let Jehovah decide for us what is right and wrong. He's the one to set the standards. Let's look at a situation uh, where we can display our loyalty to Jehovah's sovereignty, and that's in the family. If you open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at a series of verses that show each member of the family how they can uphold Jehovah's sovereignty, that they recognize it in their lives, that they're going to allow it to influence them. So now that we've found Ephesians, uh, let's look at the first three verses of chapter six. We're going to turn our attention first to children. So you young ones, how can you show that you Respect Jehovah's sovereignty. This is the way. Children, be obedient to your parents in union with the Lord, for this is righteous. 
honor your father and your mother is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you may remain a long time on the earth. So respecting and honoring your parents is a way that you show that you want Jehovah to be the sovereign in your life. You want him to direct you and show you what is right and wrong. Well, what about wives? Let's go to Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. Here's how you wives can demonstrate your loyalty to Jehovah. Let wives be in subjection to their husbands as to the Lord, because a husband is head of his wife, just as the Christ is head of the congregation, he being a savior of this body. So you wives, by your subjection to your husbands, by respecting his headship, you can show that you want to live under Jehovah's righteous rule. Finally, what about you husbands? Well, just drop down to verse 25. Let's see what we need to do. Husbands, continue loving your wives just as the Christ also loved the congregation and gave himself up for it. So husbands loving their wives, being even willing to sacrifice your own life, your own likes and dislikes for them then you're showing that you recognize Jehovah's sovereignty in your life. But what about in the Christian congregation? Well, that too is something that uh, we need to pay attention to. Because remember, one of the ways in which Satan uh, tries to detract man uh, is by exercising pride, thinking that we know better than someone else. If you look in Hebrews 13, verses seven and 17, we'll again see Jehovah's direction on how we can actually respect and honor his sovereignty in the Christian congregation. So we're at uh, Hebrews 13, we're going to read verses seven and 17. Remember those who are taking the lead among you who have spoken the word of God to you, and as you contemplate how their conduct turns out, imitate their faith. Verse 17, be obedient to those who are taking the lead among you and be submissive, for they are keeping watch over you as those who will render an account so that they may do this with joy and not with sighing, for this would be damaging to you. So all in the Christian congregation should respect the headship that Jehovah has uh, given to elders in the congregation to give it that the congregation direction. And therefore, if we respect that arrangement, then we're showing that Jehovah is truly the sovereign in our lives. We also want to look at examples in the Bible uh, that show how we can benefit from the exercise of our respect for Jehovah's sovereignty and how it benefits us. For example, uh, there were Noah, there were Sarah, Moses, Joseph, and Job, and we could go on and on about the good examples of those who walked with Jehovah, who respected his sovereignty, the headship principle in the congregation, who remained morally clean, and those who kept their integrity under pressure like Job. So continue to meditate on, think about how their example can help us to show that respect for God's rulership. We also want to stay clean from the influence of Satan's world. Satan dominates it, he rules it, the Bible says so, and we can see the evidence of that all around us. But that spirit of the world can easily infect us and could cause us to call into question whether Jehovah really is the rightful ruler or not. Well, what are some of the characteristics of that spirit of the world that we want to avoid? For one thing, we don't want to develop that attitude that we're going to do what we want to. Additionally, we're not going to develop a prideful, arrogant attitude or one where we rebel against authority. We see that all around us. 
but we want to respect man's authority over us through his governments and the like. And we want to avoid giving free reign to the desires of our flesh. Again, something that is so prevalent today. Let us not be infected by that spirit. Let us continue to uphold Jehovah's supremacy. So we want to walk with Jehovah. Even though we're sinners, we're not going to do it perfectly. We must have that desire to be dependent upon Jehovah. We want to make his will our will. We want to work in harmony with it. We want to follow the voice of Jehovah. Look how well it's expressed here in the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Let's turn there together and we'll read uh, these wise sayings coming from Jehovah. We're going to look at uh, Proverbs. Chapter three, and let's consider verse number five. Here we read, trust in Jehovah with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. That's what's got mankind into so much trouble. They rely on their own understanding, don't they? But the Bible wisely says, trust in Jehovah with all your heart. And when we do that, when we listen to Jehovah, and when we follow in the footsteps of his son, Christ Jesus, then we're recognizing Jehovah's sovereignty in our lives. Well, what's going to be the blessings, if any, for those who recognize Jehovah as the rightful rule? Well, there are many, but let's just talk about uh, a few. We know now is the time to uphold Jehovah's sovereignty. We have to make a decision. We can't sit on the fence. We have an issue before us. It's a vital issue. It's a life or death issue as to whether we support Jehovah's sovereignty. But we want to do so out of love and appreciation for all that Jehovah God has done for us. And when we do that, then ultimately we're going to be set free from enslavement to sin. As Romans chapter 8 says, we can eventually become children of God. Just think of that, being adopted into Jehovah's universal family as full-fledged uh, parts of that uh, family of Jehovah, the perfect angels, and righteous mankind right here on the earth who are going to make up a new earth according to 2 Peter Three. Now that new earth is going to be a perfect human society, one that is serving Jehovah in a united manner. And we can be a part of that. And under the rulership of God's kingdom government, Jehovah is going to do undo all the damage that's ever been done uh, to mankind. Everything that Satan has done is going to be undone. Just think of that. We will not have to be confronted with individuals day in and day out who want to do their own thing, who do things to the detriment, to the harm of their fellow man. Under God's kingdom, we can live in perfection where real love prevails. Under God's care, all the memories, all the bad things that have happened, the painful memories that we've experienced are going to be gone. They're going to be so far in the rearview mirror, we might say, that we won't even see them. So just think of it, friends. If we look to Jehovah as the universal sovereign, as the one who has the right to decide for us what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. If we remain dependent on Jehovah, then we who recognize Jehovah's sovereignty in our lives can live forever. 